Yes, say a few words, please. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I'm, um, we're, we're actually in production on a new video blog, which is going to give people that couldn't come to Comic Con um, the, just a sense of the experience of being here. So uh, I've been recruited as a second unit cinematographer. <laughs> actually, Chris has. <laughs> I just want you to do something. I just like you to do something for our blog for all the people that couldn't be here. When I say one, two, three, could you just say hi from from Comic Con? Okay, hi from Comic Con. So just wait. Here we go. And one, two, three. For a take two, that was bloody good. So who who has been camping out on the street? You, you poor sots, you poor poor bastards. But thank you, thank you very much for doing that. Um, just before we go on, I, who who here regards themselves as being a, a Tolkien geek? I'm going to introduce somebody who's possibly a more avid Tolkien geek than any of you, our co-producer and co-writer, Philippa Boyens. I'm sure we'll hear from Philippa later, especially if you have some tricky questions for him. But um, I guess we should probably run you a bit of footage, should we? Um, so the... Uh, oh, you want to watch the footage? Oh. Anyway. Um, so just, just a couple of little quick disclaimers. Um, the music tracks that you'll hear are just temp tracks. There's a little bit from Lord of the Rings. There's a couple of tracks from some other movies. Howard Shaw hasn't started to record his music for this yet. I think he starts recording with the London Philharmonic in about five or six weeks. So, so there's none of Howard's, you know, Hobbit score to be heard on, on this reel at this stage, unfortunately. Um, most of the effect shots are not finished. There's some that look pretty good. There's a few that are a little bit dodgy, but I've I pick footage where the effects are, are mostly are along the way somewhat. And, um, and you also, even though uh, at the end the title comes up, The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, there is a bunch of clips and shots in here from um, the whole story. It's not just from the first movie, just for comic -Con. Thank you very, very much. I hope uh, that was worth the wait. Thank you. Thank you very much for your support, everyone. We really, really, really appreciate it. This is a film made by fans for fans, believe me. So, um, let's, without uh, any more ado, let's bring up a few of our, uh, our friends that we have here. So, um, our uh, second unit director, who also plays a, a, a small but significant role in the movie, Andy Serkis. <laughs> Thorin Oakenshield, Richard Armitage. Bilbo Baggins, Martin Freeman. I, uh, I, I think there's a wizard lurking about there, Sir Ian McKellen. Surprise guest 
which I thought would be fun to bring up on stage, um, we, we found Frodo out the back. All right? Yeah, that is exactly... I, I am equally uh, overwhelmed by the awesomeness. Uh, welcome, everyone. This footage is stunning. Uh, stunning footage. You guys, you guys just saw over 12 and a half minutes of The Hobbit. And I think I just want to take this right to audience questions if we can, because I know a lot of people waited and you guys, you guys have some questions, so let's just open up the floor uh, right now. The button lady! Oh. Hi. Thought I was kidding. <laughs> um, I want to thank all of you for making the previous films and these films. Uh, this whole cape thing started with Lord of the Rings because I had to have a, a I'm a tree beard hugger button and no one had one. But Peter, this, this is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and the question is, I could have swore I saw you in makeup in a shot online. Peter, where will we see you in the film? I um, I actually haven't uh, I haven't shot my cameo yet, but I'm due to shoot it tomorrow when I get back to New Zealand. Seriously. I'm going to be a bit difficult to spot this time round, but I'm not going to tell you where I am. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm the handsome one. You'll recognize me. <laughs> Hello, what's your name? Hi, my, my name is Julia Wilden. Um, my father is a huge Lord of the Rings enthusiast, and he's actually an elven linguist. He worked on the original trilogy. Um, so I grew up with The Hobbit. It was like my favorite time stories when I was little. But I was um, very upset as a small child that there weren't any female characters in it. So I made him change a bunch of them <laughs> as he read it. Um, I made him make Gandalf the woman. <laughs> and um, also, I didn't actually know that Smaug wasn't a female dragon until like a year ago. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, I, my question is, um, what kind of like role does Galadriel play? And are there any female characters you added? Great question for Philippa. Uh, yeah, there are. Uh, Galadriel, um, as you all know, is the most powerful being in Middle Earth at this time. Um, and we wanted to go in there and tell that story. Um, we worked with Kate, we talked to her about the role. She did a phenomenal job. I was, uh, I, I, I had my total geek out moment when she stepped up. Um, and oh, the Battle of Dumbledore. Let me just say that, was extraordinary. Um, but so she immediately brings a very powerful feminine energy into the film. And one of the reasons it's interesting that you did that because we did feel the weight of it being a bit of a boy's own story. Um, it's at, after a while, you feel the weight of that. And we did create a character, her name's Tariel, uh, who is an elf, who is played magnificently by Evangeline Lily, who I believe. You saw a little bit of, she's our redhead. We have, um, uh, and sh uh, sh we, we created her for that reason, to bring that energy into the film, that feminine energy. And we believe it's completely within the spirits of Tolkien. You know, we tried really hard, and she, she wanted that more than anything herself. She didn't want it to be a ploy. We wanted it to sit in the world, and uh, I think you guys are going to fall in love with it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Sir, Sir Ian McKellen? I, I, I just want to say hi. How are you? I'm good. What are you doing here, actually? I'm moderating a panel oh, at the moment. And all these folks? Yeah, yeah, I invited 6,500 people to come hang out. <laughs> it's such an honor to what, what is your... Uh... Hi. Hello. Um, I'm freaking out, sorry. You guys are all, you're just amazing. 
amazing, phenomenal people, and I just want to take a moment to thank you for doing this for the fans. Um, my friend, especially Mr. Freeman, she's in love with you. She's seen the ticket like six times just because you're in it. Um, sorry. Um, my question is because in all the Lord of the Rings movies, you've kind of focused a lot on using um, prosthetics and motion capture and models of the scenes. And I was, I really appreciate that, and I was wondering if that posed any challenge to the cast and crew, like if there was any difficulties acting in the prosthetics, I know especially for the dwarves and the, the hobbit feet. Oh yeah, what are the, what are the hobbit, I always wonder like what the hobbit feet feel like to like put on and then like pounce around and... Um, they're, they're good. Uh, for the first few days, it's a little bit like a fledgling duck. <laughs> sort of finding finding your flippers, uh, but after that they're surprisingly easy. Yeah, they're kind of uh, you can forget that and just carry on with the the scene and playing the character. But um, whenever I was having a hard day or a tiring day, where I had a bunch of other people just to look at and know that I was having a relatively easy time of it physically, because everyone in huge prosthetics and big uh, costume rigs. Uh, were being far more um, heroic than I was, so maybe Richard should uh, talk about that. Um, yeah, we, we went through quite an evolution with the, the look for, for Thorin and of course all, the, all of the dwarves who are kind of very clearly defined by their features. Um, working in a prosthetic like that is, was one of the biggest challenges because you really have to work your face harder to you know, portray what you're trying to express inside. And on day one, I really didn't think that I was going to make it anywhere close to two or three weeks into the shoot. Um, but by the end of the, the journey, it's, it, I, I couldn't work without it, and I didn't recognize you know, the person uh, underneath it. But, um, but managing the heat and the, the stench of a sweaty dwarf was um, <laughs> a challenge in itself. Excellent. Uh, what is your, that lady loves you. Uh, what is your question? Hi, hello. I, I love you guys. I came all the way from Brazil just because of you. Just because of you. <laughs> I spent all my money on this trip, but it, it was worth it. <laughs> and before I make my question, Ian, I, I'm your biggest fan. I love Gandalf, Magneto. You, you are the greatest man. For you, for oh. Sorry. Okay. Oh, make sure I get that. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a T-shirt signed by Anderson Silva. It's important for me, and I would like to give it to you. Oh, wow. That's right. That's so my, my question is for Peter. I, I I gotta know this. Will you make a movie about Silmarillion? <laughs> I, I think the chances of me living till I'm 110 are very remote. <laughs> um, the, the Silmarillion is, uh, is, is totally owned by the Tolkien estate. Um, it's not owned by Warners or MGM like The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are. So, um, and I don't think the Tolkien estate like these movies at all. So um, I, I wouldn't imagine that the Silmarillion is going to go anywhere for quite a long time. All right. Sorry, Brazil. Thank Sorry, Brazil. Thank you guys are awesome. Conky Con is awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming. I kind of can't believe I'm up here right now, but um, I just want, my question is for Martin. But first, I just wanted to say, Sir Ian McKellen, I've grown up with your acting, Gandalf, like, you know, whatever, and it's just your performances will always be very, very special to me. So thank you for that. Um, my question for Martin, though, is. Were you like intimidated or maybe under pressure because you were joining such an ambitious project that's already been established with so many other actors and people who worked on the previous films? Um, in all honesty, uh, I it might sound a bit disingenuous to say, but I, I, I honestly didn't feel a huge amount of pressure. I certainly didn't feel intimidated. Um, once I'd met uh, Peter, Fran and Phil, I felt relaxed with them, I felt they were recognizable human beings, they weren't, um, they weren't trying to 
impress me. They weren't trying to. They weren't trying to do that stuff to me, which sometimes people can do, which is like, do you realise, you know, how lucky you are, kind of thing. They weren't doing that to me. They would. They just wanted me to be in the film, and that really made me want to be in the film. Um, and and obviously, you can't really take intimidation or, or pressure to work with you, you know, because you won't do your best work and you won't do your best playing, which is an actor's job. Um, so I don't, you know, when you're doing scenes and when you're just going to work day to day, you're not thinking about this. I mean, you'd go mad if you were thinking about how's Comic-Con going to react to the way I choose to move that bottle or whatever. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, very, it's very remote, you know, when you're actually doing the work. And, and it's, a, it's a friendly place to work as well. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's its own little world, uh, Wellington. And it, Co Wellington, yeah. um, and, it, and it feels it feels like a sort of special little place where these films are made, where you know your you, your your only job is just to go along and, and enjoy it and do as do as best you can. I, I can honestly say I wasn't. I mean, I, I had to find my way into it. It's not like I just hit the ground running and there was Bilbo. I had to find my way. And between me and Pete, we negotiated, and you know he usually won. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but I, no, I never I never felt intimidated by it at all. Thank God, you know, because it, it's just meant that I, I was able to hopefully do my job. You know. Excellent. Thank you. I'm curious, uh, Elijah. Have you did you did you seen the have you seen the footage before? Have you seen anything? Did I did, I did watch you watch? It? Yeah. Oh yeah, I watched it. I stood right there. What what <laughs> what what did you think? I was blown away. <laughs> Extraordinary. I mean, <clears throat> the footage as well was so. I mean, it's incredible, but it has these amazingly emotional moments. And that's, I think, at the heart of what Peter does in his storytelling, and what Philippa and Frank write, and to see that presence in this footage, because I'm so distant from this, truly. I, I really went to New Zealand for a month last year to do a, a bit of, of work, but it's, it's beautiful. I was made to feel emotional watching that footage, and to see everyone here. I mean, it's, yeah, and I think, I think, you know, the reason that everyone has a story to tell before they ask their questions is because this is such a, it's such an emotional story for people and everyone connects to it on such a personal level. And I think that's why there's so much like, you know, here's how this affected me first before I ask my question, which is a testament to the work. What, what is your name, sir? My name is Alex. I come all the way from the border, Tijuana. <laughs> all, right. all 20 miles away. First, I want to thank Ian for last night visiting the guys who came back. Which are really awesome. It was nice for me too, great. And my question is for Peter Jackson. Um, me and my sister are great admirers of you. I mean, we admire your work. And my question is, what is the process to select the scenes that will be in the theater and then the ones who will be in that extended edition? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. People, people often assume that we shoot scenes for the extended cut, you know, that the scene is somehow earmarked at the beginning is not for the movie, but the, which is not true at all. I mean, you literally write the script. Um, well, in theory, you're supposed to write the script before you start shooting, but it never quite works that way with us. Um, we write the script as we're shooting, and you shoot, and you shoot, and you shoot some more, and, and you know, the scenes, the, 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 the stories develop, I mean, it may be that we write a scene halfway through the shoot that we think we need to tell some of the story, and so anyway, it's very organic, and, and it's not until you get to the very end and you can start to look at a cut assembly of the film that you start to realize where there's repetition, where there's slow patches, where there's, you know, and, and you basically look, at the end of the day, you know, you end up with a film that's too long. And so, um, for purely for what the studio and the distributors need, you need to trim it down a little bit, which we try and do. We're not very good at making short movies, unfortunately. Um, you know, a skill, a skill I've never mastered. But um, but anyway, you, you kind of end up with you know you end up with the theatrical film and, and, and at a length that you think is what it should be for the experience, and then you look at what got cut out, and we don't put everything back because you know you literally cut out scenes that you don't need and, and are, are not a huge amount of value in hindsight but uh, when, when we cut scenes out that have nice character moments or nice further information for the story then we love to put those in, in the extended cut so it is a, it's a very organic process you don't really know until the very end um, what's going to end up in the extended cut but there'll certainly be ex extended cuts of these films I'm sure Ah, <laughs> oh, lovely.
<laughs> what, uh, I even did a little Comic Con eyeball on it too. Did you notice that? It's very detailed. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, we haven't heard from Andy yet. Andy, uh, I mean, I think, you know, the, what, anything. How, what is this like, you know, coming back? Well, let's just start. Um, I was only supposed to be coming back for two weeks to, um, to uh, play Gollum again, which uh, I was very much looking forward to, of course. Um, and, uh, and then about a month before I was about to come down to New Zealand, uh, I get an email from Fran who says, uh, Dan, I know you've probably got something on, but Pete would like you to come direct the second unit. And uh, so would you mind coming down for a year and a half? Uh, so, <laughs> now, it's not unusual to do that sort of thing in, in, in this company. And of course, uh, once I picked myself up off the floor, um, I, was, uh, I was on that plane, of course. I mean, it was a remarkable and extraordinary experience for two counts. One, one obviously working with Martin, who I've wanted to work with for a long time, and to, to get the chance to play opposite him um, uh, for that, that scene, which was, a, which was a great experience, and one of the, it was the first thing to be shot in the movie, actually. Um, we, spent, we spent two weeks uh, shooting the entire scene um, a number of times. Pete wanted to, to let it feel like um, a, a theatre piece where we could really, really play, play off each other and Martin could find the character of Bilbo. And it was a really, really amazing way of working and, um, and uh, it, was, it was terrific. And then, and then I you know, began the process of, of, um, of jumping into the director's chair, putting on the 3D glasses, getting to grips with 48 frames a second, a crew of 160 people, cranes, technocranes, a schedule, dwarves, dwarf doubles, scale doubles, stunt doubles, um, a, 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 a schedule that kept changing every two, uh, two minutes, and, and it was it was a, a huge film education for me, and and enabled by by you know the greatest mentor possible. Peter's been an immense part, an immense part of my life for the last twelve years, and Fran and Philippa, they've given me such incredible opportunities, and I will eternally be grateful to them. Yeah. They've honestly. Yeah made a massive, massive difference, and to be entrusted with that, that position um, was, was a, a dream to behold. So, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Oh, well, yeah, you, um, could you just do the voice for a minute? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to be... For fuck's sake, <laughs> Man, that ring changed you, man. Uh, we have time for one more question. What is your question, man? Oh, no. Wow, I, I, I camped out overnight for my first time in eight years with all of these lovely strangers. It was awesome. <laughs> But my question is primarily for Martin. I think that part of the lasting appeal of The Hobbit is this universal story of an ordinary person overcoming not just extraordinary circumstances, but his own fear and self-doubt. And I'm curious whether you drew on any personal experiences to understand his motivation for stepping over that threshold. Um, not directly. And if I did, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, only in the sort of universal human sense of you, know, you can empathize with people who have a, who we all have fear and we all have reservations and we all have um, places that we're scared to go you know whether they're internal or whether they're external um, so I mean, it's some, certainly something I can relate to I mean that's part part of your job as an actor is just to be relatable to things anyway um, and I guess yeah, beyond that part of it is just casting you know I, I didn't cast myself in it so you know whatever they saw they so, um, that's they. Um, uh, thank you. Um, was, you know, they thought would be helpful for me to play Bilbo, but I don't know. No, it was, it was more kind of, it's, I, I'm a big believer in knowing what play you're in, you know, and in this play I have to sort of be, in a way, the eyes and ears of the audience, you know, because I'm the nearest thing to an audience member that, that there is in the, in the film, really. Um, I think Bilbo has to be relatable to, it has to be empathetic. And, um, so my job partly is to relate that by just being open and just being, 
having a certain vulnerability, having a certain wit and a certain lightness of touch. It can't be too heavy, it can't be too riven with anything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just turn up. <laughs> well, you guys, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, did you want to say one more thing? No, I'm just saying thank you. Oh, all right then. <laughs> sorry. Everything's ruined. Let's go home. Uh, you guys, you've been more than generous with your time and your footage. Please, you guys, help me and thank you.